1985, at the West Edmonton Mall, Fantasyland opened the world's largest indoor roller coaster. This huge roller coaster operated for over 30 years and changed the way malls enticed people into them to shop. Its story starts out more trouble than most. They haven't moved in months, but the cars on the track of the mind bender have officially seen their last riders. The West Edmonton Mall in Edmonton, Alberta opened the first $207 million section of its multi-phase plan in September 1981. The 220 original retail spaces were leased immediately, with The Bay, Sears and Safeway being some of the first anchor stores. Covering 45 acres and featuring 1.2 million square feet of space, it would later become the largest shopping centre in Canada. With a population of just over 500,000, Edmonton would be changed forever with the opening and put on the map as a must-visit destination. The new mall invited shoppers to a world of luxury, with the international theme not only showing in its decor, but also throughout its 17 eating establishments. The mall was just getting started and had bigger plans. Phase 1 was an instant success, injecting millions of dollars into the local economy of Edmonton and things were only going to get bigger. With its second phase, the mall would turn into something more than just a shopping center. With a champagne reception, on August 16, 1983, 10,000 invited guests arrived in their fanciest dress to celebrate the opening of West Edmonton Mall Phase 2. The new addition nearly doubled the size of what was already touted as Canada's largest mall, with more than 100 new shops. To celebrate and stay on theme, entertainers from around the world performed to the crowd. But it wasn't the shops that made Phase 2 stand out. It was the tourist offerings, with a full-size indoor ice rink, aquariums, bird aviaries, sculptures and replica fountains. The biggest and most talked about addition though would be Fantasyland, the world's largest indoor amusement park. Newspapers called the place not only the largest shopping mall, but perhaps the most bizarre. Fantasyland opening with 17 rides over three floors included bumper cars, puppet shows and an arcade with ferris wheels and kiddie rides and its plans didn't stop there. Fantasyland was a kid's paradise. To celebrate the opening, a time capsule was sealed in one of the park's pillars to be opened in 2033. Everything added in phase two was created to try and entice tourists and shoppers into the mall to spend money a concept that was ridiculed by many as something that would not work, but later became a staple at many places around the world. From the day the park opened, there were all kinds of talk about what would come in the future to this must-visit destination. Stories range from a SeaWorld-like park being added which may or may not include killer whales to full-size water parks. But right away, as Fantasyland opened, one thing was for sure. The mall had confirmed that the amusement park would double in size by the end of 1985 and include a world-class roller coaster. The mall's owners, Triple Five Corporation, began right away lobbying for tax concessions for the expansion of Fantasyland, calling it the eighth wonder of the world and the Disneyland of the North. With the announcement of Phase 3 came a newer, bigger Fantasyland. The park planned to expand to 28 rides, including a huge three-loop roller coaster with a mile-long track. Fantasyland would no longer be just for kids. This new roller coaster would be touted as the biggest indoor roller coaster in the world. And it was. Reportedly going to cost $6 million, the bright red steel structure would weave throughout the new expansion. 
Its purchase itself, however, started with trouble. After the ride had started being manufactured at Schwarzkopf, the German company went into liquidation due to bankruptcy. It was the company that liquidated Schwarzkopf's assets who closed the deal to sell the already under-manufacturer ride to Triple Five for a total of 5 million German marks, which was less than $3.1 million and around $432,000 less than what the roller coaster had even cost to make. Shortly after this period, Schwarzkopf again went bankrupt a second time and a new liquidation firm had to take over because the previous liquidators who had sold the ride were now in jail and the original deal was reviewed. And the people now in charge could not understand why it had been sold so cheap, stating that something about this roller coaster is wrong. This new company now in charge of Schwarzkopf refused to sell spare parts to Triple Five, owners of the mall, until they disputed the bill. It was revealed that the mall had been buying spare parts from another German company, but the liquidation firm did not know which. Because of the cheap sale of the ride previously, they continued to refuse to sell spare parts to the mall. Originally designed by Werner Stengel, opened in December 1985, Mindbender had a height of 145 feet, reaching speeds up to 60 miles per hour on its 4,198 feet of track. Riders would line up and pay $3 each to take on the indoor triple loop coaster. Inspired by Dryer Looping, a traveling coaster that first operated in 1984 with a very similar layout, riders climbed the lift hill and descended the sharp, left-hand, 127-foot drop, heading through the extremely tight layout and through the extremely tight three vertical loops. These loops could create up to 5.5 Gs of force, placing it near the top of the list of coasters with the highest forces on riders. The coaster was fast, huge for an indoor attraction, and very intense. As one of the many new rides added with the expansion, the indoor amusement park looked to be on the up with a roller coaster that they got for a steal of a price, and with the mall expected to draw in 8 million tourists within the next two years. A shopper's dream and a world of excitement, West Edmonton Mall. Surprises wait around and return at West Edmonton Mall. West Edmonton Mall. A world of shopping pleasure. West Edmonton Mall. Attractions for adventure. The selection will greet you there. Within the first three months after opening, reports started coming in that riders were complaining of injuries after riding the new roller coaster. These intense forces were pushing riders' heads down and jarring them to the side. The mall owner's company responded that it was not possible, and the ride was carefully designed to avoid such injuries. The only way such an injury could occur, they said, would be if riders had turned around to look behind them or rode with their arms up in the air, and they warned against doing that on a sign. They continued, if you sit in the seat the way you are supposed to, and hold on, you won't get hurt. They did, however, increase signs around the ride to warn those of possible injury. The local mall doctor said that he had reported only a couple of minor injuries that have happened on the ride, and if it was actually a bigger problem, he would have reported it. It's the world's largest indoor roller coaster. They call it the Mind Bender. Less than six months after opening, at 9.40 p.m. on June 14, 1986, tragedy would strike the troubled ride. One of the four cars on the ride derailed during the third loop and hit a nearby pillar, causing the death of three riders and the injury of 19 others. The park was immediately shut down and a full investigation would begin. The blame for what happened came from every angle during the early days of the investigation. The province's safety codes for attraction were said to be reported as out of date. Maintenance workers for the ride reported they had criticisms of the attraction two months before the incident, when two of the ride trains collided in the station after some electrical switches had been disconnected. That time, nobody was injured. Others blamed the incident on rusty parts of the coaster, which occurred when the ride had been shipped uncovered from Germany. In 1986, the official reason for the incident was released. Four bolts holding a plate that kept the ride's wheel assembly in place had failed. This likely happened over multiple days until all four failed and the tragic incident occurred. Maintenance workers testified that they checked for broken parts under the coaster in the days before the incident. 
The official report stated a failure in maintenance and a design flaw combined to allow the fatal incident to occur, with some blame placed on the ride's manual only being initially available in German. At the end of November, after 54 days of testifying, the first stage of the inquiry ended. As the mall's owners left the inquiry room, they announced plans that the roller coaster would open early in 1987. 555 announced that the ride's cars were being rebuilt right this moment under the supervision of the ride's original designer, Anton Schwarzkopf, and that all the requirements for the reconstruction that had been mentioned from consultants and during the testimonies at the inquiry would be adhered to. The mall's developments were also planning a lawsuit in Germany where the ride was built. People have been looking at the, the situation as it sits, but the police investigation is going on. Uh, it appears uh, from, the, from what we can see that a, a major part of the undercarriage sheared away. Investigators are now trying to piece together exactly what did happen and why. Much of the blame from the owners during the testimonies were placed on the bankruptcy of Schwarzkopf, stating they believed they were getting the Rolls Royce of roller coasters, and what they got was unfinished. Anton Schwarzkopf had actually been fired during the bankruptcy and he did not oversee the completion of the construction of the ride. The testimony went on to reveal that a bolt had been found on the ground by a mechanic three weeks before the crash and that they were only visually checked by maintenance staff as they had been told they were factory sealed and could not be changed. The provincial inspector had found nine loose bolts during the inspection of the ride. The following year, in January 1987, 555 filed their $3 million lawsuit in West Germany against the receiver of the bankrupt Schwarzkopf company. The inquiry into the incident cost Alberta taxpayers $1.3 million. In late January, plans to reopen the treble ride became the new focus of the mall. While the mall owners were keen, Labour Minister Ian Reid said that it would need the final report from the inquiry to even be considered for a new operating licence. That inquiry had recently been reopened, with Triple Five's lawyer taking issue with not just the criticism of the ride's maintenance, but the public inquiry itself. Much of this was due to their own lawsuit against the ride's manufacturer. The inquiry and lawsuits would drag on for over a year, until the report was released in July 1987. Triple Five had tried to keep the report private, but this was denied, and it was also made public. The Fidens confirmed blame on the ride's manufacturer for the improper axle assembly, with an unnecessary gap in the component and the lack of bolt adhesive. The report did, however, also question that inadequate guidelines given to the mall, the quality control was lacking in maintenance at the mall, and that a high standard of care was not given to the ride. Inadequate maintenance documentation and a failure to understand components of the ride all led to the tragic incident happening. Triple Five, however, stated that they saw the report as a vindication, saying that the money spent on the report had been a waste and they could have told them that from day one. As soon as the report was released, Triple Five said they had the rebuilt roller coaster trains with more wheel assemblies on each car, and three cars rather than four, and that they would begin to test the new trains within the next few days. On August 14th, 1987, after a year of closure, Triple Five owners took the first ride on the reopened attraction and declared it safe. Hundreds of onlookers watched and cheered as the rebuilt trains returned to the station. Just a few short hours after receiving its inspection certificate and passing, Mindbender was open again to the public. The new train featured new anti-rollback features, two further wheel assemblies, seat belts, and over-the-shoulder headrests had been added. This was mostly to help with the pain that riders could experience on the ride from their head jolting. They also implemented a very strict maintenance schedule where the ride would be inspected at multiple times throughout the day. While the ride had reopened, the lawsuits continued behind the scenes for years. The ride remained extremely popular and, more importantly, issue-free after its reopening. Over the years, multiple people even got married on the ride. One couple got married after riding in 1989 on Friday the 13th, that marriage, though, was annulled shortly after, as it was with a prisoner who was on day parole after a day of drinking alcohol. 
The past incident wouldn't be forgotten, and would not only change Alberta law forever, it would also impact the park's name. The Walt Disney Company asked the courts to order them all to stop using the name Fantasyland for its amusement park. Richard Nunes, chairman of Walt Disney Attractions, testified in a civil trial that the coaster crash hurt the Disney company's image, and they were regularly asked if the Disney Fantasyland was involved. They also stated that the Canadian amusement park had a poor copy of Disney rides, including a submarine ride, and was basically a ripoff trying to use the Disney name. It didn't help their case that even from its opening year, the mall used Disney's success to advertise. Why take the children to Disneyland in far off Los Angeles? Experience West Edmonton Mall's Fantasyland right in your own backyard. The battle over the name went on for 10 years, with many appeals. Eventually, the court sided with Disney, and the West Edmonton Mall had to come up with a new name within 30 days. The new name for the park would be Galaxyland, chosen from a local competition. I'm the Scream Collector. I've been collecting screams at Galaxyland for several years now. Football captain. I always like samples from Mindbender. After the ride's reopening, it operated without issue for many, many years within the West Edmonton Mall, becoming a legendary roller coaster surrounded by myth and mystery. People didn't forget the accident that happened but it didn't stop the many, many people riding it. Nearly everyone who was a fan of roller coasters had heard about the legendary, huge indoor roller coaster in Canada. Mindbender remained for 37 years, the largest indoor coaster, and over the decades became a staple of the mall. It often ranked in the top 50 steel roller coasters in the world, and for many people, over three decades became a feat to conquer and was filled with nostalgia. If you were lucky, people could even ride it at times with some of its seats running backwards. When West Edmonton Mall closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic for eight months in early 2020, Galaxyland would also. The amusement park would not reopen until October 8, 2020, with the Mindbender remaining closed. The over three-decade-old roller coaster would never open again at the park. Many stated multiple times that the ride was waiting for parts and it would be back, but it remained standing but not operating for years. In January 2023, it was confirmed that the Mindbender would be removed and be replaced with new family thrills. It remained the tallest indoor roller coaster, never losing that record when it was operating. In October 2021, Epic at Doha Oasis Quest in Qatar took the title of tallest indoor roller coaster. Though, that just launches up a spike, so does it really count? You can be the judge of that. Mindbender's history started troubled, built and purchased during Schwarzkopf's bankruptcies that within a year of opening had a tragic incident. After it reopened with rebuilt trains, it remained a staple of Galaxyland for over 30 years stay in the same as areas around the mall change drastically, eventually becoming known as a legendary roller coaster in Canada. It is impossible, however, to remember this roller coaster without remembering those who lost their lives on it so many years ago in an accident that should never have happened. As for Mindbender's future, if it will be scrapped or sold to another park currently remains unknown. Triple Five would take the successful concept from the West Edmonton Mall and go on to create the Mall of America. In the 1980s, they stated West Edmonton Mall wasn't just a place to shop, it was a fully-fledged tourist attraction. And the people in this area would never have to go to New York, Paris, or Miami ever again, they could just go to the mall. They said they decided to bring those places to Canada. West Edmonton Mall paved the way for many, many other malls around the world to incorporate more than just shopping, something that still exists at some places to this day. While originally attended as just another mall, it became much more than that, a fantasy land. Well, at least until Disney sued them anyway. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. 
Follow us on Twitter and Instagram for updates on upcoming episodes. We will see you next time. My daughter Leslie loves the Mindbender so much, she's going for a record number of rides!